Good morning, Launching Pad Church. Y'all, I'm so excited to be here with you guys. You guys know it's been two weeks. I've been on a break, a little hiatus. It's been great to just get a chance to just refresh and recharge and reboot. Somebody say reboot. Um, today we're going to be continuing in our sermon series on the topic of rebooting, okay? Um, before I get started, I always got to shout out our pastors. I hope they're watching online right now and they can hear me. Guys, we love you. We're praying for you. In fact, I just want to pray for them real quick. I want to be intentional about that. Um, we're just going to... Josh, I just want to encourage you guys to join me in just praying for them. So, dear God, I just want to pray for PC. I want to pray for Deb, God. I thank you for them. I thank you for their yes, Father God. Every time, Father God, that, that I, I pray for them, God, I'm just so grateful that they say yes to you. They said yes to you and that they continue to say yes to you every single day, Father God, into this mission that you've given them. Lord, I pray that you will just refresh them and recharge them and take them to a new level, Father God. God, I come into agreement with all the prayers that are being prayed right now, even in the hearts of the people in this congregation, Father, for, for your will to be done in their lives. We thank you and we bless you, God. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm so grateful. Grateful to be here. Grateful to share the word. It's not every pastor, y'all, that gives people chances to speak. That's not them. So I'm definitely grateful for that. Um, but in addition to that, um, we're just going to move on, right? And so... Um, we're in a theme, and the theme for this month is reboot, right? And so as I was preparing for this message, I actually found this article about how apparently you're supposed to reboot your computer like once a week. I don't know about y'all, but I don't do that. Like with my computer, I just close it, and I like never turn it off until like I like really need to turn it off or something because maybe it's acting weird, right? But I found this article... And it said, um, it, gave, it was like a list of reasons why you're supposed to re re reboot your computer once a week. The first reason, it says memory issues, right? It also says it corrects software glitches. It speeds up performances, your, your computer's performance. It saves you time. It fixes emergent issues, so issues that may be arising. It fixes them. And it can solve Bluetooth connection issues, okay? It can solve Bluetooth connection issues issues. And so there are a number of reasons why, um, there are a number of reasons why we reboot our computer, right? And so for me, I was kind of taking this and I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this in terms of um, our spiritual lives. I was connecting it to our spiritual lives, right? And why is it that sometimes we need to reboot? I think it can be very similar reasons to this, right? So again, the issues of just having um, memory issues, right? Um, where sometimes we forget who we are in Christ, right? And we need to, like, reboot. Sometimes, you know, there's, in terms of just even um, our time, right? Sometimes we're going through things, we're struggling through things, all kinds of things, wasting time because we need a reboot, right? And, and so I believe that God um, wants to kind of focus on something that I feel like was connected to this, which is the last part, which is a reasons to reboot is that it can solve Bluetooth and connection issues, right? And I think there's a big problem, like what I was sensing in my heart as I was preparing for this sermon was an issue of connection. It's an issue of connection. And sometimes we find ourselves in a position where we are disconnected from God. And because we are disconnected from God or we're feeling disconnected or distant from God, we need to reboot, okay? And so um, we're going to be talking today about being disconnected. We're not just going to talk about being disconnected. We're going to talk about how to get reconnected to the Lord. Amen? Because how many of you guys know, even if you're not in a season right now where you feel like, oh, I feel disconnected from God, it's coming. We all go through it. And even if you're, even if you're like, I don't know if it, you've been there. We've all been in a position where either we were disconnected from God, and if we're not there now, we're probably going to... We're going to find ourselves in this place. This is just a part of living life, doing life with the Lord. Sometimes we're on it, and sometimes we mess up. But that's just the nature of, of us being fallen. That's the nature of the fact that God uses fallen people in order, to, um, in order to fulfill his purposes for our lives. And so I came up with a little list here of signs that you may be disconnected. Signs that you, you, may, you may be disconnected from God right now, all right? And so the first sign that you may be disconnected from God right now is that 
you, your faith has become routine. Like, you know, you come to church because that's what you do on Sundays. You pray before you eat because that's what you're used to doing, right? You, you say, God bless you or praise God because that's what you're used to, right? Another sign that you may be disconnected from God is that you're neglecting spiritual disciplines. I'm telling you. I think it's like one of those things where it's like you neglect your spiritual disciplines so you become disconnected from God. And then you also become disconnected from, when you become disconnected from God, you neglect your spiritual disciplines. What are the spiritual disciplines? There's a lot of them. But most commonly we got, what, reading your Bible, praying, fasting, med meditating, rest, right? These are different disciplines that we neglect. We find ourselves in positions where we're grinding more. We're not resting in the Lord like, the God, like God told us to rest, right? We're not praying like we should pray. Or maybe when we pray, you know, it's just like, God help me, right? Or we wait till things are just really bad. Another thing is putting things before God. And I'm not talking about like, obviously sometimes it happens, right? But if you've noticed that like it's been a minute since you've been placing something else in priority above the Lord, it's a sign that you may be disconnected. Lack of church attendance. I love the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about how we are not supposed to forsake the gathering of believers. And so, and, and I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh, if you don't go to church, you're going to hell. That we know that this is, we know that we are the church. This is a building and we come to celebrate and to worship the Lord together corporately, but we know that we are the church. But I'm gonna tell you something. Going to church is definitely important and it definitely helps. It's important to be in community. I remember my old pastor used to say something so good. He says that you can love people, you can love God by yourself, but you can't love people by yourself. And God calls us to love him and what? Love others. Not just love others, serve others. Not just serve others. He calls us to be an encouragement to each other. We are part of the body of Christ. The Bible talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that he says that, to, that God has given different people spiritual gifts. And what is the purpose of those spiritual gifts? To build up the church, right? It's, it's one thing if God has given you a prophetic gifting and then you're just at your house having all these prophetic dreams and having your own moment, that's cool. But that gift is supposed to be to edify the body. And so the gift that God has given you is to edify the body. How do you do that when, you, when you're not part of a community, you know? And so, again, sometimes when people are going through things or you start to get disconnected, you'll notice a lack of church attendance, also serving with the wrong motives, right? So you start doing things for God, but it's not really for God. You know, it's like for you because you like want to look the part, right? You, you start doing things just because you want to look a certain way, this one's a big one. You're more comfortable with sin. Oh, my God. Y'all have to understand, I'm a church kid. I grew up in church, right? And so I remember when I was in high school, like, I was part of, like, youth leadership, worship, all these doing, doing, doing the most, right? And there were people that, like, I was in high school with that served with me or people that I knew that were on fire for the Lord, but they were also maybe in positions of leadership and they were doing different stuff. But then it's crazy because as soon as, as soon as they were no longer in a leadership position, the true colors were showing, right? As soon as, you know, they were out of their parents' house or they went to college or they just got a little bit older and they weren't really doing the things that they were doing actively, you see the fruit of that and that they're more comfortable with sin. I remember that I had a friend who would never, like, you know, go live with somebody before he was married. And then all of a sudden, he was like, yeah, I'm going to go live with this girl. And I was like, bro, you good? Right? These types of things happen when we disconnect from the Lord. We become more comfortable with sin. Sin that at one point we were like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't do that. I'm, I won't touch that. I'll do, I'll, maybe, but, like, I'm not going to touch that. But now all of a sudden, it's like... If half God knows my heart, like if it happens, it happens. Like if it doesn't, it doesn't. Like we become desensitized literally to sin. Like it's not something that grieves the heart of the Lord. And it's not something that we should, that should be grieving our hearts. And lastly, we're not bearing any fruit. We are not bearing any fruit. Y'all, Christian people, like, I feel like sometimes we're so, we're so quick to judge and look at somebody else's life and be like, oh my gosh, like, they're X, Y, and Z, they're this, they're that, or this pastor, or this person, and we're judging and we're saying, oh, it should be this way, we should do this, we should do that. But what's the fruit in your life look like? I had 
a moment for myself where I had to sit down and say, sis, like, what, is, what fruit are you bearing? Because the truth is, is like, as the believers, the Bible tells us that Jesus says, I am the vine, John 15. John 15, it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you're not connected, like, it says that, that he pretty much cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. Like, that's what the Bible says. But, and we're called to produce fruit. We're called to carry the fruits of the Spirit. But sometimes we, we, may, we may find ourselves when we're disconnected in a season where we're not producing fruit. Maybe at one point we were preaching the gospel. I know for me that was a big thing. When I first came to know Christ, I was 16 years old and I was talking to everybody and their mama about Jesus. I was on the bus talking about Jesus. I mean, I low-key still do that, but I still feel like there are times where I, I, I don't go as hard as I used to, right? And it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, you can't live off yesterday's break, breakthrough, yesterday's encounter with the Lord. Okay, God gave you a dream last year. Okay, God did a miracle in your life five years ago. I was listening to a pastor preach. He said, it's not about what God has done in your life. It's about what he's doing right now. Some of the things that maybe in your life, it's like, you know, in the past, you were this, you were that, you were on fire for God. But what about now? Where is that fire? Where is that flame? Where are the people? I had, yo, I was talking to somebody. I connected with this woman, and we're talking about the things of God. And she was, she was encouraging me and stuff, but she asked me this question that I've never been asked in my 28 years of love living. She said, she said, how many times have you preached the gospel last week? I was like, well, dang. It took me aback. No one has ever asked me that question. And I feel like it was so profound to me because at the end of the day, the truth is the fruit of being connected is you're going to share the word of God. You're going to be preaching the gospel. You're going to be doing these things, right? And so we want to make sure that we're able to show those fruit as believers. We want to make sure that our faith is not become routine. We want to make sure that we're not neglecting their spiritual disciplines. But the, thing, the truth is when we start doing these things, again, like I should tell you guys, take notes. If you don't have something, grab something, take some notes. Because y'all know I be here talking about a lot of stuff and dropping a lot of scriptures. But these are signs of spiritual neglect like of of you being disconnected from the Lord and that's a problem like it's actually like a problem like and we have to kind of try to find a solution for that and where are we going to find that solution we're going to find it in the word see sometimes we feel disconnected and we're asking ourselves why why do I feel disconnected why is it that I used to sense God's presence more and then I did now I don't know why is it when I used to pray miracles used to happen and and now I don't know and why is it now I feel weird like when I pray I've been there moments you sit and you pray and it's like you feel like you know you're talking to God but it's like my prayers are just like bouncing off the ceiling like my words don't feel like they're they're like breaking through heaven and, and reaching heaven we get like that sometimes and I should say part of the time, sometimes it's like that because I would say, this is a little side note, we get in positions where we begin to associate the presence of God with a feeling, but the presence of God is not a feeling. We can experience the presence of God, right? We can feel the presence of God, but the presence of God itself, like God's presence is not a feeling. And sometimes I feel like we get in these positions where we think that Something is wrong with us and God because we can't feel him. We have no goosebumps or I didn't cry today. So, like, the Lord isn't with me. But that's not, that's not the Bible, right? And so we want to make sure that we're being biblical in that regard. But in addition to that, right, another reason why, you know, we may feel disconnected from God can be found, I believe, in the first scripture that we're going to read here from Revelation chapter 2. All right, we're starting at Revelation chapter 2. It's gonna, we're going to read verses 1 to 7. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus, in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold, golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and, and have endured hardship for my name. Verse 4, this is it. This is it right here, y'all. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Some version says you have forsaken your, what, first love. Consider how far you've fallen. 
repent and do the things you did at first. I mean, I feel like that right there is just a word. Like, I could just, like, walk away. Repent and do the things you did at first. The things you used to do when you were first falling in love with Jesus. You don't do, it. You don't do them anymore. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from this place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I've been meditating on this scripture. You have forsaken your first love. You're wondering why you're, you feel disconnected. I, may, I, may I suggest for some of you guys is because you have forsaken your first love. I think the interesting thing about connection is really deep. God was, God was helping me to really like process this and think about this. How many of you guys know when you're like, when you're talking to someone on the phone and the phone gets disconnected, what do you do? You call them right back, right? If you go to charge your phone and your phone's on 1% and the charger disconnects, what do you do? Can plug it right back in, right? And, and there's a lot of times like when it comes to our relationship with God, these types of mindsets don't transfer over, right? When it comes to the things of this world, when it comes to our cell phone, when it comes to the Wi-Fi, I know when the Wi-Fi start acting weird, I'm, I'm start looking at networks, I'm trying to see, I become an IT specialist real fast when my Wi-Fi is not working in the name of Jesus, okay? We're going to find out why this joint is not working. I problem solve, because I want to get connected to a network, because I want to have this connection, because I know that this connection is going to give me something that I want, right? It's going to give me something that I want. But we start acting funny. We start moving a little weird when we feel disconnected from God. We sit in our, dis we sit in that. Sometimes we're not as proactive. I find that sometimes it's very interesting how we as believers can be proactive sometimes about all these different areas of our lives. But then when it comes to our relationship with God, we're not proactive, like we don't really know, like we don't really, it's like we lose all intelligence. But, but, but it's, we have to, to really have like this sense of urgency. Again, the Bible talks about like we are the vine, He's, Jesus says I am the vine and you are the branches, right? And so like to one, in one respect I was thinking about it, like how is it possible that we can be disconnected but then we're still like connected, right? And I feel like God kind of um, gave me this example of, like, um, an iPhone. Have, have you ever met somebody who had an iPhone but didn't have service? So, like, when somebody has an iPhone but they don't have service, like, you could use the phone and you could kind of seem like, you know, you just like everybody else. But if you don't have service, you know that if you do not have that Wi-Fi, you cannot communicate with anyone. And you cannot make direct calls. All you can do is just look at it, right? And so I feel like what, one of the things that I was kind of like thinking about was that sometimes I feel like we as believers, it's like we're like that, we're like that person walking around with that iPhone. When we come to church and there's Wi-Fi, we connected. When we talk to other believers, all of a sudden we connected. But the truth is, is there's no service. There's no deeper connection. There's nothing that's able to help us to have this relationship and sustain this relationship with God on our own independently. And this is something that is very important for us to have as believers. We need to be able to take ownership of our spiritual lives. I remember one time that was something God was talking to me about. It's so easy to come to church and be like, oh my God, like that word was not for me. Or like sometimes we get prideful. Sometimes we, we have all these things going on in our head. Again, it's like that critical spirit. You're looking at everything critically, but you don't got no fruit. You're looking at everything critically, but then you're not, you're not doing your part in terms of sustaining your relationship with the Lord. You have to have your own connection with Jesus. If you come to church on Sundays and that's the only time you talk to God and you say you're a Christian, that's weird. Respectfully, that's weird. We need to have a, a connection, maintain that connection with the Lord so that we can, so when we come together, it's going to be amplified rather than, again, coming to the house of the Lord and letting that be our hotspot. 
where we are able to now connect with the Lord and, and, and do all these things that we, we never did before. It doesn't make sense. And so, again, sometimes we, we do this thing and we have this habit of, of dis- finding ourselves in a position where we are disconnected from the Lord and we want to get reconnected to God. But this is not the first time that this has happened. I love the Bible, y'all. I love the Bible so, so much. I always encourage people to read the word. I love the word. And I, 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 when I was thinking about the Bible and I was thinking about an example of a people that was just so disconnected, I think, of Israel. And it's crazy because we, that's what we were grafted into as Gentiles, right? We we're grafted into, like, this, this Israel. And we just like them. We just like them. This was a big problem in the people of Israel, right? They were idolatrous. They were distracted, and they had a habit of disconnecting from God for extended periods of time. So much so to the point that they eventually were exiled for these reasons, right? And in Jeremiah chapter 2, God calls the people out on an era, the era of their ways. And he says in verse 13, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. This Again, this is Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. It's going to be up on the screen if you, if you want to take that note, that note down, okay? Jeremiah 2, verse 13. I'm going to read it one more time. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cistern. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And if we were to be honest, we often commit those same sins, we in our minds know that God is enough. Like we know like God's enough, like God is sovereign, God is faithful, all that. But Jesus is the living water. Jesus is the living water. And we know that, we get that. But then when it comes to a cistern, like maybe some of y'all don't know what a cistern is, but essentially a cistern is supposed to be a, a, it's a, a waterproof space that is often used to collect rainwater. But God says that they forsake, they, fors- they forsake him for a cracked cistern. Maybe, like, if, I need y'all to understand, like, if a cistern is cracked, it can't hold water. And at that point, it's purposeless. It literally has no purpose. And that's sometimes what we do, right? We put our faith, we put our hope, we put our, 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 our independence, our freedom on, on, in cracked cisterns. Things that can't hold water. Right? And so when we do that, it's very much like what the Bible describes in Psalm 35, verse 16 to 18. We are putting our faith in, in these, these idols. The Bible says that they have mouths but they cannot speak. And they have eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear and mouths but cannot breathe. And those who make idols are just like them and are all who, as are all who trust in him. This is the reality of the life that we, we, we live. Like, this is the reality of the positions that we find ourselves in sometimes. Crack cisterns. Putting our faith, putting our hope in different things that it's like, it's not even going to do anything. My iPhone, like, sometimes some of this, that iPhone for some of people, it's, it's, it's an idol. It's an idol. It's something that can be very useful, but it, it literally becomes an idol. It distracts us from, from, from spending time with the Lord. It distracts us from so many things. There's so many different things on there. But that, that iPhone was made with human hands. That iPhone is not going to answer your prayer requests. That iPhone doesn't, it's not going to give you a breakthrough. It's not. Sometimes you go to the phone and then you go on the app and then you just, you got more issues now in your head than you had before you got on the phone. And it's like that, not just with the iPhone. Sometimes it's like that with relationships. We put our faith and trust in relationships. And not just the romantic ones with like, okay, like, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, but also even family sometimes. People idolize family. We idolize so many different things and we're putting our faith, we're building our identity off people, off things, off possessions, off money. For what? That thing has, it has eyes, can't see. That person Ears, but it's not God. Essentially, it's not God. It's not going to, you cannot get God results from something that is earthly. It's not going to work. That's not how it works. And they cannot do for us what the Lord does for us. 
And so I believe that the problem that, we, that I'm going to be, like, addressing and what God has put on my heart to talk about today is just this problem of just being disconnected. And I believe that some of us, because I have faith that God gave me this word for a reason, that some of us have been feel, feeling disconnected from God for, for quite some time. Going to church, disconnected. Praying, but disconnected. Reading the word, but disconnected. Encouraging people in the things of God, but disconnected. But hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. We serve a God that wants to connect with us. We serve a God that wants us to reconnect with him. We serve a God who promises us in James chapter 4, verse 8, that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And so we serve a great God, and God wants us to reconnect with him this morning. And so here's the question. How do we do that? How do we reconnect with the Lord? How do we reconnect with God? It might be a little bit easy, like I said. Sometimes we jump for the iPhone and we plug it back in because we know the solution. If the phone plugs out. Sometimes we restart the computer real quick because we're like, oh, I know, like, I did that before, like, that worked, like, maybe if I do it again, like, it'll work. I remember someone, I saw someone do this, or whatever the case is. But we need to really take the time to assess and answer the question, how is it that we can reconnect with our Lord and find ourselves in a position where we are, are connected? We do this by disconnecting ourselves from the things of this world and reconnecting with the Lord. We get Reconnected with God by disconnected from all the things of this world. The Bible tells us that this is not our home. The Bible tells us, I believe in 1 John chapter 2, that, that all this world has to offer us is just lust of the eyes, pride of the flesh, you know, and just this desire for everything we, we see, right? All these things that, that we may want or that we may feel in our heart, it's like we don't need it though. What we really need is God, and we have to learn how to disconnect from the things of this world. We have to learn how to recognize that this is not our home. We have an eternal purpose. There's so much more than just this moment. I remember, like, you know, I, I remember someone used to always say, we, we, we get into a position where we think that this is it. This is the point. This is the point of life. This is, this is it, this life right here, like this, our existence here. But it's not. And in addition to that, we're going to take a look at another passage that I feel like can really provide us with some insight in terms of some different ways that we can reconnect with the Lord. This passage comes from Joel chapter 2. And this, in this passage, Joel starts off, the, this chapter 2, it starts off with Joel prophesying about judgment. He prophesying about the judgment of God. The day of the Lord is going to come. And this is going to happen. And it's going to be crazy, right? And so... He's prophesying all these things, but it's so interesting. It shifts. There's like a shift that happens, right? Um, and starting at verse 12, it says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the, Lord, for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and, nursing infant, and even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule of the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? This passage, along with many other passages in the prophetic literature in the Bible, is truly a testament of the grace of God. Y'all, one thing that I don't, I don't really like when people say, they talk about how in the Old Testament, how like, oh, grace wasn't really a thing. It's like, what are you talking about? That is wild. How is it that in the same chapter, God is talking about literally judgment is coming. Like, pull up on me. Like, judgment is coming. And then in the same chapter, he shifts and says, return to me. If that's not grace, I don't know what is. That is the grace of God. 
And, and not only that, another thing sticks out to me about this passage. Because like as I said before, we're looking for a solution to the problem. We're looking for a solution. And I feel like that there are some solutions in this passage. Are you guys ready for some solutions? Well, I mean, y'all were supposed to answer. I said, are you ready for some solutions? I was like, y'all just want to be disconnected from God? Like, what's, like, that's, all right, anyways. So the first solution I have is to repent. 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 This is a very, like, Christian word. And so I figured that I would take some time to kind of break down what it means. I got a little repentance 101. And so the first aspect of repentance that we want to consider, um, especially based on what we're seeing in this passage and what's, what's happening, is that repentance includes turning away from sin. We have to turn away from sin. And I have a slide coming up that has, has the different points on it so you guys can um, read it. But the passage that I have, that the part of this passage that I feel like connects with that, you'll notice that I, I highlighted certain words. Starting at verse 12, it says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not just your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. I love this. If God had to tell them to return, y'all, it's because they, they, weren't, they, went, they went a different way. When you tell somebody to come back, it's because they're not, like, there's disconnect. The person walked away. And God is calling us to come back this morning. And so that first aspect of repentance that we see is this turning away from sin and turning to God. If you could just go to my next slide. So the first aspect is to turn away from sin. We see that because the passage tells us to return, right? The next part is just being remorseful, like actually being like real sorry, right? Like, and we see this in the passage because the passage says it talks about weeping and mourning. Again, sometimes when we're disconnected from God, we get to this position where we are okay with sin. We're comfortable with sin. We are not grieved by sin. But when you know, like, when's the last time, like, you grieved about sin? When you know that you did something to offend God, not because you just, like, felt bad or you thought you were going to go to hell. Because, I don't know, sometimes <laughs> I realize, I talk to some people, I don't really think about, like, going to, like, I am not motivated in my relationship with God by fear of going to hell as much as I realize some people are. It's not just about not going to hell, y'all. There's so much more to having a relationship with the Lord than just I'm not going to hell, right? And so we want to actually, like, be remorseful about our, the sin in our life and be sorry about it because we know that it offends God. And when you love somebody... The last thing you want to do is offend them. It don't matter if it's the God of the universe or you're just your, your spouse or your friend. Like, you never really want to hurt someone's feelings intentionally. That's weird. If somebody does that, stay away. That's just weird. But we don't want to offend God. When I am sorry for my sin, when I'm remorseful, it's because I love God so much. And I don't, I don't want to do something that breaks his heart. I don't, I don't want to do it. And so the second aspect of repentance is there's a sense of, like, remorse, right? The third part is that it's genuine. That's why the passage says, rend your heart, not your garments. Some of you guys may not know this, but the people back in that time or the Israel, like, people in Israel, when it came to, like, grieving and stuff like that, they would literally put on, like, sackcloth and ashes. They would look just mad, depressed, and just be very, very dramatic about grieving and just being remorseful and things like that, right? But, like, sometimes I feel like for us, it's, a, it's maybe we not putting, like, a whole garment on us, right? But we can very much like they did look repentant on the outside and say words of repentance, but it's just a facade. It's just a facade. And we don't want to be like that. Like, a part of repenting is it, it just has to be, like, genuine, 
It has to be actually something happening in your heart. They gave God lip service and externally and looked repentant, but it wasn't genuine. For example, if I say that I'm going to work out and I buy workout clothes and I call Faquan and ask him how to do exercises, but I never actually follow through, that's, is that, do I genuinely, I might have good intentions, but like, I'm not being genuine in the fact that, that this is something that I actually want, right? Or if I say that I'm going to save money or I'm going to cook and I can say all these things, sometimes some of us, we're more talk than action. And a part of this genuine repentance, it is accompanied by action. Like, and this action, I always want to point out, it's not on you to be perfect and have it all figured out. Please understand when I say this, because some of us, we grew up in very religious environments where it's like, oh, I, 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 I can't do this, I can't do that. Understanding that, like, we are in a process of constantly becoming more like Jesus and being sanctified by the Lord. But in that process, it's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. You have to rely on God. Don't just listen to me talk about repentance and say, I'm going to get it together. No, you can't get it together. If you could get it together, they wouldn't have sent Jesus. You can't do it by yourself. You need to press into the Lord. You need to get reconnected to the Lord and be at his feet and trust him to come and do the things that he needs to do in your life. And so the first thing that is very important for us to do when it comes to, again, reconnecting to the Lord is repent. Genuine repentance. Remorseful repentance. And actually just understanding that I, I have to turn away. This is what it is. It's turning away. It's returning back to God. It's being grieved by the things that I've done that have offended God. Or the things that sometimes, you know, sometimes even, sometimes I feel like it's like we do things. And the things, the sin that we get caught up in because we sin, we just like, we now create this space between us and God. But God wants us to return to him. And so the first solution, repentance. The second solution is consecration. Consecration. This is a word that, I don't know, I feel like I ain't hear this word in a sermon in a very long time. <laughs> Again, I'm a church kid, so. Consecration. In verse 16, it says, gather the people, consecrate the congregation. Consecration, again, verse 16, it says, gather the people and consecrate the congregation. Consecration essentially means for something to be set apart as holy unto the Lord. And again, this is something that we don't talk about in anymore. But I feel like God is some, this is something that is very important to the heart of God. I remember there was a hymn that used to say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. I love that. Because this is something that God has called us to do. And sometimes I feel like, again, we just get a little slow when it comes to the things of God. Because it's very easy to consecrate things outside of God. Like, when it comes to, like, for example, like, this might seem so basic. You ever have some house shoes? If you have house shoes, you don't take those shoes outside. They stay in your house. <laughs> in, some, in, in some way, you literally like consecrate these shoes to this space because you don't want the germs, you don't want this, you don't want that, right? To get involved into it. Or sometimes I think of another one. I'm West Indian, so, you know, my parent, my mom, she got this china. I don't know about y'all, but my mom got this one china. Nobody, like, we barely use that thing. <laughs> Consecrated. Special occasions only. Right? And it's like, we can do that when it comes to the things of this world. We are able to do it. We set it aside for special use, and that's how we're supposed to be for God. Because I am the temple of God, because I am the church I'm not just going to be outside doing whatever. It's, not, it's just not how it works. Because I am the temple of God, I'm, I'm going to live set apart. I say this all the time. If you hang out with people that are not Christian 
and like it's just no difference and like you're just you just you just blend in it's it's weird as children of god we should stand out we should be different we should talk differently sometimes i've been in situations everybody around me swears and then someone is like yo i realize you don't swear yeah i don't cuz we're not the same like i love you and stuff but like i'm living for jesus like my body is a temple of god even certain things as a young woman it's like yo things that you know it's like you think it's cute you want to wear and it's like but we are not the same my body is a temple of god i can't just I'm set apart for the lord it's a different mindset when you're living your life and you're like i am set apart for the lord holiness is something that is also connected to again consecration and this is something that that we don't talk about anymore I would say maybe in certain denominations I'm going to keep it funky in certain denominations that's that's all they talk about respectfully but I would say that at large I don't know the last time I watched some internet sermon and and someone was talking about holiness being holy before the Lord but the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1:15 to 16 as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you have had you had when you lived in ignorance but just as he who called you is holy so be holy in all you do for it is written be holy as i am holy be holy because i am holy god has called us to be holy i think of another scripture i don't even have it in my notes first peter 2:9 talks about all these things people in the world does but then first peter 2:9 what does it says it says but you are not like that It literally starts off, but you're not like that. You were once like that, but but you are a God called you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation of peculiar people. Again, a little you got to be a little weird sometimes. Peculiar people that God has called out of darkness. And so there needs to be a distinction. We need to consecrate ourselves. Sometimes there are things in our lives that we just need to surrender to the Lord and we just need to lay at the altar and just not pick up no more. I remember this there's a story and I've told this story before but I was at a service of prayer and fasting at um one of the churches I used to go to when I lived in Boston. And I remember I heard God tell me to to give something up. I'm not even going to lie. It was actually I'll, I'll just be honest. It was it was a playlist on Spotify. He said delete all your secular playlist from Spotify and I said all right and the thing about me is like I listen to music that's not I don't strictly listen to Christian music but if I'm not listening to Christian music y'all I'm very very picky very selective so any song this is like my standard if the song literally goes against the bible like I'm not listening to it if I know the bible is like be pure and the song's like don't be pure like I'm just It's just it's just not the math ain't mathing, all right? Like the Bible talks about that in James. It's like how can blessings and curses come from the same mouth? Like that doesn't make sense, right? Another thing I watch out for when it comes to listening to music, I I also be careful and I listen to, um to not listen to things that I know that are going to make me feel this way and get me in some type of mood or headspace that's just not conducive to where the Lord what the Lord wants to do in my life. The Bible also says in Philippians 4:8 that whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is admirable, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is lovely, think on such things. It's Philippians 4:8. If I know that listening to this one country song that I love in one time it gets to be exciting, but then another time I listen to the song and all of a sudden I'm depressed. All of a sudden I listen to the song, I'm mad. All of a sudden I listen to the song and I don't want to wait on the Lord no more and I'm going to slide in someone's DMs. If I know that the song is if I get any sense the song is going to like do that to me like I just don't listen to it even if it's clean. So these are my standards for listening to secular music. If it's against the Bible. Again, if God says don't kill people and the song's like I'm going to kill people. Like I just don't think that as a child of God that is my portion and I don't think that's I'm not that's going to not that's going to prevent me from thinking whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. and it's going to affect me. People think I feel like I'm I'm going to tangent real quick. But people think music is just music. They know it's just a song. No. Music is very spiritual. Why do you think we sing before the word? Why do you think we come to church and we sing? We set an atmosphere. 
If I come in here and I sing, worship music is such an atmosphere. But if I come in here and I sing like some, even if it's like some Christian rap song and it's up, it's a whole different vibe. And then if you're married, you know people, they like to play their little love songs. Like, it's a different vibe. It's a different vibe. It does something. And so I say all this to say, hopefully that encourages you. But on a different note, you can be surprised why, you can understand why I was so shook when God told me to delete my secular playlist. I'm like, God, what? What is wrong with this? And I begin to think about other Christian leaders and people I know that listen to certain songs. And I remember I just heard the words in my head, and it was the Holy, I knew it was the Holy Spirit. But I heard, let there not among you. I said, let there not among you? What's that? I said, that sounds like a verse. So I looked it up. I typed in all the words I had, let there not among you. You know what verse it brought me to? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. You could put it up on the screen. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's people. Not even a hint, y'all. Seems like a lot of pressure. But also, again, remember, it's the Holy Spirit that makes us more like God. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts our heart. And I remember as soon as I looked up this scripture and I read it, I heard the Holy Spirit say, consecration is not a seasonal thing, it's a lifestyle. Consecration is not the, y'all, I can't make up stuff this deep by myself. I promise you, I'm not this deep on my own. I, I don't have what it takes to be thinking of scriptures. Like, I didn't even have the whole scripture. I just looked it up. And this is what, that's the scripture that came up. And God told me, boom, consecration is not a seasonal thing. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's not about what other believers are, may or may not be doing. I remember the Holy Spirit was telling me, you don't know what kind of disobedience other people could be living in right now. You have no idea. Sometimes that's what we do. We make other believers the standards. Well, they love God and they da da da. Well, okay, but they're not Jesus. But they're a man just like you, sin, sinful, like born and, in, born and shaped in iniquity. You know, and so it's very important for us to have this understanding, for us to consecrate ourselves to God, for us to understand that God has called us to be holy as he is holy. It's important for us to understand consecration is not a seasonal thing, it's a lifestyle. I know sometimes, again, like we, I feel like whenever, a lot of times too when I was younger and I would hear people talk about consecration, it was like, oh, we're about to go do something serious, we must consecrate, we must consecrate, it's time to, what were you doing this whole time? How are you living this whole time? What is it about your life that you have to now flip this switch and do a 180 and now consecrate? It's weird. It's giving, it's giving weird. I, I just, again, this is the solution. One of the solutions. First solution is, first solution is repent. Thank you. First solution is repent. Second solution is consecrate. Our third solution is Fasting! Yay! Everybody clap for fasting. <laughs> yeah, I just be having fun. <laughs> the Bible says in our scripture that we're looking at in Joel chapter 2, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion and consecrate a fast. If you could just put that on the screen. Blow the trumpet in Zion and consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. I don't know about y'all. I, no, I don't know one person that likes to fast. Even for me, like, I don't know if I like fasting. I like the benefits of it. But when that whole, like, and I'm not talking about, like, the social. Social media with fast, that would be easy. Social media, like, oh, yeah, fast from this, like, fast from tech, easy. That food fast, that, that biblical fast, like, when they were in the Bible, they was not doing, so, this, Jesus, God was not saying go do a social media fast. It's a different type of, this is a, you're not eating fast. And I believe that this is something that is so important and it's part of the solution for us to, to fast. Sometimes we don't want to do it. But it's not enough to wait until the church does a church fast every year at the beginning of the year to fast. It's not enough to wait until your life is in falling apart and you're in shambles. You don't know what else to do. And you're like, you know what? I know what? I'm just going to fast now because 
you, you literally, you're at your wit's end and you know that this is something that's just spiritual, that's going to, you feel like it's just going to jumpstart you and fix all your problems, but like, God has called us to fast. This is supposed to be a part of our life as believers, like a regular part of our life. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, it says, Jesus says, and when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they look miserable and disheveled so people can admire them for fasting. I tell you the truth that the, this is the only reward that they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees you will reward you. One of the things that I've always loved about this verse, I heard one preacher say it one time. Notice that it says, when you fast. When you fast. Meaning that the expectation is that you're, you're going to fast. This is, this is expected. Jesus assumes that his disciples and followers will be people that fast. We also see this laid out clearly in Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 15. One day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, Why don't your disciples fast like we and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating the groom? Of course not. But someday, the groom will be taken away from them, and they will fast. The expectation is that, like, this is part of our lives. Yeah, sometimes we get it, we have to pray, we have to read our Bible. But I don't think it clicks in our brains that, like, this is also, like, a spiritual discipline. We save it kind of like consecration, right? We wait until we about to do something serious for God, and now it's time to fast. But it's not just about when I'm about to go do something serious or I'm, I don't know, or like you're, you're at your wit's end that you should fast. It's part of the discipline. It's part of something that God has called us to do. Fasting is not something we do because we're trying to prove something to God. We have, like, what are you trying to prove to God? He knows your heart. It's not something you do because you're trying to prove something to other people. Like we read in the scripture that People who are doing stuff to try to, like, you're trying to show off all the stuff, that's your reward. You're going to get that attention, and that's going to be it. It's not something that we do to try to, 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 to even prove to ourselves, I can do this. I can fast. Again, that's that religious mindset. That's that I can do it without Jesus' mindset. And that's not what the Lord wants. We cannot do it without Jesus. Again, God would not have sent his son if we could do it on our own. And so God has called us to fast. He's called us to meditate on scripture, to pray, to rest, to do all these different things. And I believe that these are three ways that, three things that you can do, three solutions. Where if you feel disconnected from God right now, and even if you're not, save it. Because I'm telling you, this life, you be, you be connected one moment and the next second, you, don't, you look up, you don't even know who, who or where you are or who you belong to, and it's a whole hot mess. That's why we need to continue to stay in the word. We need to continue to renew our mind in the word. Sometimes there's scriptures that you know, but you just forget it. I had that happen to me this week. I was having a conversation with somebody, and I forgot about a scripture. Like, I was looking for scripture to, like, use, and I couldn't recall a scripture on the topic that we were discussing. And then later I was talking to my other friend, and she brought up a passage, and I was like, oh, that was such a good passage. I should have brought that up. But it's like it just wasn't in my head at the time. But that's why we have to constantly renew our mind in the word of God. We have to constantly renew our mind in scripture. Again, we see as a solution in this passage to this disconnect, to repent, returning to God, to consecrate, setting ourselves apart, taking the time to really analyze our lives and be like, yo, like, what is of God? What is it that I need to let go of? And three, being able to recognize that fasting is a part of the life of a believer. It's just a regular, it's regular, it's normal. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out, marked out for us. How do we do this? We do this by fixing our eyes on Jesus. 
Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning in its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. If you've been feeling disconnected from God, I want to encourage you not to grow weary, not to lose heart. There's hope. Solutions, repent, consecrate, fast. Repent, consecrate, fast. And we must disconnect from the things of this world in order to connect with God. We have to do it. And so I'm just going to pray for us today. (sighs) Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you, God, that you are such a loving God. That like your word says, you're slow to anger and abounding in love. We thank you, God, for your character, for who you are. God, I pray, Father God, for anybody who's been feeling connected or distant from you, that this would just be a wake-up call, that this would be hope, give us hope, that, that we don't have to sit and struggle in the same stuff over and over again, but that we can, we can change not by our own might, not by our own strength, but by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you, God, for the process of just making us more like you. Sometimes, God, it feels really icky, and we don't want to go through the process of that. But, God, we invite you into our lives. We invite you into our lives, God. And, and God, I pray that you would help us, God. I declare, God, that you would help us to to draw near to you, God. Because your word says that if we draw near to you, you're going to draw near to us. Help us not to be so drawn to other things, God, more than we're drawn to you. Help us, help us to, to not find ourselves, God, and, or if we're in a position, God, where the world, God, has our attention and our affections and our heart more than, more than you. God, we pray that you would just help us to course correct this morning. We don't want to be more filled with the world, the world's music, the world's gossip, the world's the latest everything. We want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And the truth is sometimes we be so filled with this other stuff. It's like there's no room left for you, Jesus. God, we, we make room for you this morning. We pray that you would just have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Amen. And so I want to thank you guys for coming to church today. I got one last thing to say. Welcome to Launching Pad Church where our vision, mission, and goal is to what? It's to what? Love God, love people, disciple all nations, and launch you. Point to someone and say, yes, you, into your prophetic destiny. Come on, make some noise. Have an amazing Sunday, everyone.